Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to another JKMRC Friday, Friday seminar series. Um, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections with country, and we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So today it's my great pleasure to welcome two speakers, um, Daisy Ambach and um, Alistair Grubb. So um, well, Daisy is an engineering professional with seven years of experience in the resources and extractive industry. After graduating with a bachelor's of engineering degree, majoring in chemical and environmental disciplines, Daisy began her career as a process engineer in major, major mining and oil and gas projects in Australia and the UK. She then transitioned to Mount Isa as an environmental engineer, championing, um, championing tailings and dam safety initiatives. Um, she now works as a principal uh, project engineer with Glencore's Zinc Global Capital Studies and Projects team, where she is exploring tailings, reprocessing and repurposing projects alongside her, co her colleague, Alistair. And Daisy is also an advocate for the resources sector and she's lead, um, and the leading role it can play in addressing the world's sustainability challenges through mine waste transformation. Um, and then I'm just going to um, also say something about Alistair. Um, Alistair is a project manager responsible for capital studies within Glencore Zinc Australia and has delivered uh, studies across multiple assets, commodities and throughout the met um, and throughout the metals value chain. Originally graduating as a geotechnical engineer from RMIT, Alistair has 20 years of experience across various technical operational management and project development roles and has significant experience across multiple mining and metallurgical operations. Completing an EMBA at QUT reinforced and enhanced a keen interest in tackling complex and strategic problems facing our assets and industry. Alistair believes that innovative business models will enable the mining industry to support the sustainable advancement of society. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Um, so the title of the talk today is The Journey to Tailings Re Reduction, an Operator's Perspective on Building the Business Case at Brownfield Sites. Please join me in welcoming Al Alistair and Daisy. I'll give it a test and make sure it's all switched on. Thank you for the um, introduction and sorry for the mouthful <laughs> of different uh, blurbs, but yeah, uh, we're really excited to be here today. Thanks everyone and those online as well. Um, as uh, Christy alluded to, we'll be giving a presentation on some of the insights that we've gathered over the last 12 months or so on a tailings reduction um, or tailings reprocessing project for Mount Isa Mines. Um, we're very much in the early stages um, and have uh, uncovered some challenges that we're looking to share with you today um, and also hopefully inspire some um, thought and, and action on how we go about as an industry in terms of resolving those um, challenges. We'll both be up front with a disclaimer that both Alistair and myself are not experts in the business of tailings reprocessing, nor are we experts as closure planning practitioners. We're just a bunch of projects people who are very passionate about the topic. Uh, but we do know that there's many people out there who actually have um, been able to successfully resolve some of the challenges that we'll describe here today. And we hope that some of the questions that we're asked, uh, be talking through today and some of the challenges um, that we'll be um, discussing, that um, we can inspire others to learn from those who have um, been successful because only in sharing success can it grow. It's all working. Yep. No worries. While you do that, I'll um, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, on which we meet today, uh, which are the Jugara and Turbul people, um, who are the traditional co custodians of land here in Brisbane or Mianjin. And I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to um, the lands from which those who are dialing in online are calling from, um, making sure that 
we acknowledge their connections to land, sea, and community. How are we going over there, Tom? Good? Great. So before we get into the meat of um, our, our projects, I wanted to start off by talking through more holistically the, the context of the industry. And I quite like to refer to EY's um, top 10 business risks and opportunities um, uh, survey that they do every year. Um, so for those who don't know, um, EY, they do a survey annually and they interview 150 mining executives, both from C-suite positions, as well as senior leaders across um, technology, HR and environmental disciplines in their organizations. And they put together this list um, of the top 10 things, which I think is really insightful as it talks to what other things that are currently front of mind for the industry. And I'd like to unpack a little further the top three risks that were identified in last year's survey, which is ESG, capital, and license to operate. Starting with ESG, they have a, a list of the different factors or the top factors which um, are most heavily scrutinized by investors. The first one that is on that list is the um, is local community impact, which I think is very closely related to license to operate, which I'll talk to in a few slides time. And the next most important or most scrutinized ESG factor is tailings and mine waste management. I was quite surprised to see it so high up the list, particularly in the context of emissions reduction and net zero focus, I would have thought that this would come down a little further. So I asked myself, well, why is it so high? And it's because the industry has a lot of tailings. As EY noted, over 200 billion tons of tailings are currently actively being managed in facilities across the industry. And they project that an additional 40 to 50 billion tons of tailings are going to be generated over the next five years. To put some of context to these numbers, I thought it might be useful to compare it to the number of Olympic swimming pools in which that amount of tailings would fit in. So I just got a picture there of the UQ Olympic 50 meter swimming pool. And just to put, put some rough numbers to it, I've assumed a density of 1.8 tons per meter cube, which is roughly the density of mud. And that's 100 billion meters cubed of tailings which is equivalent to 44 million Olympic size swimming pools. To put that into context, that is enough swimming pools to cover the whole land mass of Croatia. So the mining industry produces a lot of waste and hence one of the main reasons why it's heavily scrutinized by our investors. Next on the list is capital. EY notes in their report that the current state of the industry is both an opportunity as well as a major risk for capital. Because of the growing demand for critical minerals and metals to support the transition to net carbon emissions, it means that we are seeing a lot of investment also in the industry. But according to UI, that's not enough to meet the shortfall of, the met of critical minerals and metals that we will need to support the transition. And if we impact that a little bit further, according to the IEA, by 2030, we'll see critical minerals demand double. So double the amount of mining for some of those metals such as copper, lead, lithium, cobalt, zinc, nickel, than we currently are doing today. So there's a lot of opportunity, right? Growing projections for these metals means great investment for the sector. So good opportunity to start putting some shares into the mining industry, right? Well comes at a risk as well. And I quite like this graph by um, Greg Mutt down at the Monash University, uh, which produced a few years ago. And I think it tells a good story, not just for Australia, but also for the wider mining sector, where we're seeing declining grades, um, or the general trend towards declining grades in our ore bodies. So that means that mining is becoming more difficult. We're going to have to recover metal from um, lower grade material um, and mine at depth in different ways, which means more complexity and therefore more cost. The other sort of risk factor, if you will, in the sector at the moment is also some of the volatility in commodity prices. And I made this graph a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I know there's been a bit more movement in the copper price uh, since then with the um, 
uh, BHV and Anglo um, uh, interactions recently. But I think the story is still the same, that in the last 18 months, we've seen a significant decrease in uh, commodity prices for some of these critical minerals, particularly nickel, cobalt and zinc, which are sort of like, um, framed as a battery metals, we've seen them decrease up to 82%. And that's enough to put mining projects and mining operations um, at a stop. One example is Core Lithium, who've recently ceased mining operations um, as a result of this. So what does it mean? It means that the industry, oh, sorry. It means that the industry is at odds with needing more capitals to secure long-term stable supply of critical minerals for the transition in the face of more volatile market conditions and high cost of mining, means capital is risky. The final pillar is a license to operate, or as, a, as we've recently heard internally, um, tr transitioning to the wording privilege to operate. Through their survey, EY observed that the mining industry is increasingly challenged by the license to operate. One reason is that mining companies are now expected to focus on value beyond the life of mine. This means that a mining project is not just a commitment to the time of operation, but also what comes after. It means that mining companies are now expected to commit to social investment that build resilience in communities for when mines close. And this makes sense. Usually a community will move around to a mining project or a mining operation for, for the life of mine. And we want to make sure that those communities are resilient and sustainable beyond that period as well. But mining companies are not always the experts in the regions in which they operate. It's the community who are. So cl closely working with those communities to co-develop solutions for long-term value is important. But this does take time. One of Glencore's mines in Canada, Raglan, um, Code developed a strategic social investment program with communities. And this program intends to create projects uh, which provide direct and long-term social and environmental, sorry, social and economic development for the community. So it's a committee um, involved in, involving Blencore as well as members of the, of the community. And together they um, come up with these projects and um, manage those projects in a, in a collaborative uh, format. But some of the projects that have come out of this framework have taken more than a decade to co-develop and deliver on. So iterating that this focus on co-development, time needs to be allowed for it as well. So if we take a step back from these three top risks, I'm observing a wicked problem at play. We see on the left of, of the slide the financial pieces of the puzzle, with unprecedented demand for critical minerals and metals in the next five to 10 years, for which supply chains are not yet matured. We see more difficult ore bodies at lower grades, at depths with more complex mineralogy, making mining projects more costly. And this means that there's a higher capital risk for investors to um, invest into the industry. And some of those factors are at odds with the right side, which is the social and cultural pieces of the puzzle, with longer timeframes required for mining projects to get approved, the expectation to focus on long-term value generation, which takes significant engagement and time to co-develop, and the expectation to focus on mine, minimizing mine waste and tailings production in the context of declining ore grades. That's difficult. So I try to summarize some of these elements into a problem statement. How can the industry ramp up production to provide the minerals needed by the world to transition towards a low carbon future that requires mining in new ways in a volatile market that is nature positive or low waste and can deliver value to communities now and beyond life operations? I don't know about you, but that's a, a big problem to solve. My hypothesis and um, some of the thinking that Alistair and myself have been doing recently is that tailings reprocessing and repurposing could be part of that solution. And this is what I'll also explore over the next few slides. So just to make sure that we're all across the basics, um, just wanted to explore a little what, what is tailings or what are tailings and 
many of you would know, it's the material that's left behind um, from the concentrating process. So once we've extracted the metals of interest or the minerals of interest, it's the waste stream that comes out of our processing plant. And it's generated, um, it uses, often there's water that's added to our plants as well. So usually what happens is this material is dewatered before it is then dispersed off in a large storage facility or tailing storage facility, which is usually a above surface um, engineered structure with dams or sometimes we also see them deposited in um, used open pits as well. A little bit on the history. So in the last decade, we've seen quite a lot of development with regards to tailings uh, management. And that's been in the face of some tailings dam failures, uh, which I've listed a few notable ones up here and on the slide. Most notably um, is the uh, Valles Bermudinho, um, in Brazil, which led to 270 fatalities. The industry res has been responding to this, uh, particularly through the introduction of the Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management, or the GISTM. For those who don't know, this is a document that outlines 15 principles and 77 requirements for tailings management across design, operational, social, emergency, and environmental aspects. And one foundational pillar to the GISTM is a focus on transparency, which is what mining companies have been focused on over the last five years through submissions on the, by the Church of England, as well as to recent disclosures for um, compliance with the GISDM on extreme and very high facilities. Glencore also has partaken in this process and our disclosures are available on our website as well. The focus of the industry so far um, as a result of, of this new standard has been very much on focusing on making things safe. But now we're seeing some focus towards looking at alternate solutions as well. And this is where the ICMM's tailings reduction roadmap um, comes into play. The ICMM released this roadmap and highlights a commitment from ICMM member companies to collectively advance progress towards developing improved and cost-effective alternatives to tailings storage facilities. In the backdrop of that, we've also seen a lot of development with regards to legislation and strategies here in Queensland as well as Australia. Most notably is the Queensland government's mined land rehabilitation policy, requiring mining companies to commit to a progressive rehabilitation and closure plan. We've also seen numerous sustainability related policies and critical mineral strategies and battery strategies being published both at a state and national level. But as you can see, there's a lot of standards and policies and none of them explicitly talk to each other, but can be used to inform strategy on tailings reduction. And I find that the waste management hierarchy is quite a useful tool as well to navigate the tailings reduction question. Evidently, if you start at the top of that, preventing tailings or preventing waste is the easiest way to reduce it. And what this looks like is doing this upfront in the mine itself. So this is looking at improving our understanding of the ore body where this waste sits and then implementing selective mining type of technology so that waste never gets mined in the first place. The next option is to reduce waste. And this is something that you can do within the plant. Um, better technologies for sorting up front, better segregation, um, coarse particle flotation is, is another one that I, uh, I've heard of being used in this context so that we actually reduce how much tailings needs to be deposited um, going forward. If these options have been ruled out, there's not much you can do. Tailings will be produced. So the question then becomes, what do you do with this tailings? So recycling is one, um, you know, the next step in, in the waste management hierarchy. And I think there's sort of two elements to this one. There is reuse. Hold on. Ah, sorry. <laughs> there's reuse. So looking at reusing the tailings or substituting the tailings in another process. 
And one way that we do this um, in Manasa, for example, is we take our tails and um, substitute it as aggregate into our pace fill operations. The other focus then is recycling itself, which is actually transforming the waste. So applying some process to it to turn it into a usable product. If that doesn't work, really struggle. If that doesn't work, then recovery is your next option. So this is where you, have, you, you still have a waste stream and a tailing stream, and there will need to be some deposition or storage of that. But there is still some, an, um, some in situ value there that's worth recovering. And this is where the tailings reprocessing um, uh, idea fits, fits in quite well. If there's no options beyond that, then you are left with disposal. And that looks like a storage of tails. There's still some options here to repurpose or, or um, rethink how the footprint of a tailing storage facility is used so that it can still provide some value. But in some cases, there is no other options. So you are left with disposal as your final, final option. And that, does, that means that there's no recoverable value from that waste stream. But where you are in the life cycle of a operation also limits your options in terms of which, which parts of the waste management hierarchy you can apply. Prevention and reduction options are generally easier in a greenfield operation where you've got time to, and time and resources to implement some of these options. But for a brownfield project with live tailing streams or already deposited tailings, your options are limited to the bottom half of the hierarchy. So even though you're limited to the bottom half as a brownfield operator, there's still a lot of optionality and complex interactions between different parts of the value chain. Alistair will talk through now what we've been doing in terms of thinking in that space, specifically for Mount Isa Mines, where we've been exploring a tailings reprocessing study. Thanks, Daisy. Yeah, so Daisy's given a really good overview of the, I guess, the, the, the global landscape of where we're sitting, and I'll now bring it forward to um, a little bit more localised to our project and um, what it's meaning to us. So Mount Isa Mines currently operates two, two concentrators, one lead zinc and one for copper, and both of those concentrators deposit into the MIM tailing storage facility. Uh, the facility is in the valleys of an adjacent ridgeline, and it's formed with four major dams, TD5, TD7, TD8, and the West Wall Embankment. Uh, tailings were initially deposited there into TD5 back in 1958, and we've been operating that ever since. Prior to that, we operated seven or up to seven smaller facilities around the site, and those have largely now been covered over and their footprints have been repurposed for other aspects of mining, store, um, uh, you know, stockpiling and that sort of thing. Uh, that's with the exception we do have a tailings dam that's still um, uncovered out of George Fisher mine um, that ran for a short amount of time. That's now used for process water storage. So currently the MIM TSF covers uh, over 1,500 hectares. It's about 35 metres deep at its deepest points and it contains over 300 million tonnes of tailings. Now the tailings are a mixture of multiple different ore bodies from at least six different mines. So we've got the Enterprise and X41 copper mines, George Fisher, Lady Loretta, uh, remote zinc, uh, lead zinc mines, and then we've got the um, MIM old lead mine and the Black Star open cut, which have all deposited into this tailings dam, as well as uh, lead, uh, copper smelter slag reprocessing and some more tolling across the years. So you can imagine that this is quite a complicated mix of product and can introduce some processing challenges. As Daisy mentioned, we do send our tailings through a paste fill and a hydraulic fill system and send uh, tailings underground as backfill in town. And we also remine tailings from TD7 and TD5, truck that out to George Fisher, and it goes into their paste fill system as well. The closure plan for this facility largely entails a store and lease type cover requiring a metre and a half of regolith followed by half a metre of growth, um, growth media over the whole facility with the aim of getting it back and remediating it to natural bushland. 
Uh, with that backdrop, MIM in 2003 initiated this concept study into looking at how we could reprocess the tailings dam and through our existing facilities with the aim of recovering some value by reduce and reducing closure costs and also um, to improve the closure outcomes. To, to, to achieve that rehabilitation, a huge amount of material is going to need to be won from nearby borrow pits and moved around the site. And the drill blast and excavation and, and uh, material movement is anticipated to take many, many years. So that got us into our study. We initiated the study with an idea generation session with a multidisciplinary team. We started off with not a great deal of background information about the tailings dam. We obviously knew our volume and we've got global grades from processing information. We also had some um, grab samples that had gone through some basic flotation tests. Uh, our idea, idea set generation session really focused on what output products we could generate or what outcomes we might be able to achieve. And then we put um, hypothetical process flows about how we might be able to get there. And I'll talk through those through, through, and they're largely aligned, um, aligned with this slide and we sort of separated the study into different strategic themes. So from the first side of things, um, we can recover metal. Now, I, I, I'm, I've mentioned that um, obviously the, that large size of the tailings dam um, and the multiple concentrators going into it, our processing guys have done a pretty good job of, um, of, of recovery. So we've got quite low, low grades out in that tailings dam. But we did, one of our themes is obviously pick the stuff up, put it through our existing processing facilities because they're there and see if we can recover, say, a bulk copper zinc con or a separate copper zinc con. We call that a simple and fast approach. Uh, the next stage would be to consider new metals, or, um, new products, uh, and that could include cobalt or rare earth elements or something else. So we've classified that as a uh, maximised metal approach to the recovery. It's worth noting that when we're only targeting metal, we might recover a product, but we don't have any significant input, uh, significant uh, effect on the volume of material that we're left to deal with at, at the end of the day. So secondly, we focused on the sulfide content of the, of the dam. So massive amounts of pyrite in that dam, and that's obviously a significant risk for acid uh, acid drainage from the dam. So looking at removing that sulfide, we saw two pathways, and one is going for uh, more of an acid creation focus, where we strip off a pyrite concentrate that could be a suitable feedstock for generating sulfuric acid. And alternatively, or potentially as well as, we look at maybe pulling harder on our recovery and actually pulling out a dirty sulfide con that just pulls everything we possibly can out of it, leaving a desulfidized tail at the back end, which could either be used as a cover sequence or part of a remediation process, or potentially even produce, uh, result in a dam and a tailing storage facility without the uh, acid generating potential. The next step along is looking at, uh, at aggregates or bulk products. Um, this could be silica or construction sand, uh, bricks, dolomite, could be for fertilizer or for cement substitute. Uh, and all of these things could have ec an economic value, um, but more importantly, could actually significantly reduce the volume of material that we're dealing with at the back end. So in this aspect, we're really talking about a repurposing side to the study rather than uh, reprocessing. Uh, establishing a market for these products is a, is a challenge, and I'll talk about that in a bit, bit more detail in a minute. The final aspect is if we're picking the stuff up and we get to, and we're going to reprocess it, well, the next step is we get to choose how and where we deposit it again. So we can try and uh, improve the closure outcomes as, as opposed to our base case. So as you, you can hopefully gather from this, we are taking a very holistic approach to this study and looking across uh, multiple different avenues. And at the early stages, we were certainly seeing that we probably need multiple, uh, multiple parts of this to come together to produce a viable business case. And that's about where the, our expertise ends and we start bringing forward questions. Um, so the next part of it is, is very much around 
presenting the challenges that we've we've seen while we're trying to push this through a, and generate a business case as as an operator. Um, I've presented some insights and I've put them on a spectrum from sort of financial to a cult cultural aspects. Uh, and we sort of hope that by presenting these, uh, this enables uh, people that might be looking at similar studies to help frame up their study work to take it, take it, um, take it, uh, consideration of what we found as our challenges. So starting from the more straightforward financial end, um, the value of the metal in the product. So I've noticed, I've noted that our core products, um, copper, lead, zinc, they're, they're uh, processing guys have had a really good crack first time round and got pretty reasonable recoveries. So the tailings that have come out the back end are quite low grade and we've then mixed them with a whole nother tailing stream. So the idea that we can then pick up that combined two concentrated tailing stream, put it through our existing plants with the same flotation technology and create a viable business case is probably doesn't stand up to logic and our testing has, has proven that so far. Um, I mentioned that we can chase new metals, and that is certainly certainly possible and certainly um, something we can do. However, as we do that, that introduces new technology, new capital into the business case, and starts making that more challenging to to come to to come through. It also introduces marketing uh, marketing and execution risks that don't exist in in that simple and fast aspect. Uh, an example, and Daisy alluded to it before, is we, we hear a lot about the critical minerals requirement um, and the, the, the need for critical minerals, rare earths, that sort of thing. However, um, there is significant risk in that, in that market uh, and in that value chain, and it can be a barrier for many, actual, many operators, uh, especially when we're talking about internal competition for capital. Uh, we know that there are supply gaps forecast and they're very much focused around anticipating the demand for this new economy, but they don't really have a good view on the supply side of where that product's coming from. So we certainly see these massive high prices in some of these products, um, but they feed into a market that's immature, opaque, and often quite small. Um, so the introduction of new product to market can be devastating to prices and therefore the business case and place the operators under extreme uh, financial risk so Daisy mentioned, you just look at lithium, cobalt, nickel in recent times, and then you've got your case in point. So um, investing and then operating in that sort of environment um, might be more suited to companies uh, that are targeting that exposure to the critical minerals market and the developing market, rather than for operators that are needing to pivot away from their core metals. The next challenge that I'll highlight is around establishing the value of reduction to closure. So this is a big one. Uh, closure costs are inherently difficult to estimate well ahead of execution. Um, and as an industry, we're successfully and continually underestimating by 50, 100% plus more. Um, you know, there's global, globally a multitude of examples. And then more recently and closer to home, um, we've got ERA's Ranger, recent releases. So really significant issue. And when we're underestimating our closure costs or we're not putting in adequate contingency into our numbers, that is a significant hurdle for a tailings reprocessing project because you're unable to show the true value that you might be offsetting through your work. Also, discounted cash flow analysis when we're looking at these studies is hampers us because we've got the uh, cash out the door for closure costs and the revenue generated by, uh, by the reprocessing is heavily discounted out at the back end of mine life. We've also got the fact that a discounted cash flow model will reward deferral of costs, but doesn't adequately take into account the real risk of cost escalation, which is likely to occur. Secondly, on the closure execution, um, the outcomes are technically complex and a lot of the time they're unknown, it requires the science. So if we're talking about making a change to something, the science isn't yet done to understand what the value of that change is. So a key example of that in, in our study, we're talking to our talking internally to our team. Okay, so if we can generate a desulfurized tail, how thick does that tail, that desulfurized layer need to be before we can materially change that rock cover sequence and not need to mine and blast as much material and move it there? And we just don't know that yet. Um, if we could create a desulfurized tail and put it back in the dam, 
what's the maximum that that sulfur content has to be to not need to cover or to reduce our cover cover expectations again. So these things, these the, all these questions require the science, the, the, the modelling, the trials to do, and that takes time and money before you can actually understand what your business case is for that reduction. So moving on to the valorization items, uh, the aggregates and that sort of thing, um, markets may not exist for the products uh, or the spe specifications might not exist to what you're technically able to achieve. And when there's no visible market for a product, an operator might not know what to test for or how to test, so miss, miss the opportunity to actually test and trial those products. Also, tailings are inher inherently contaminated, so you very quickly run into a risk barrier around talking about what you can do with the product. Additionally, any bulk products are hampered by distance uh, and transport costs. So that regional business ecosystem is really important to understand. So using the circular economy mindset, um, really need the opportunity might actually lie outside of the current, um, current product specifications or standards, but somewhere in the middle that is technically achievable by the facility owner and also acceptable to some customer somewhere. Um, so without understanding that local regional ecosystem, that potential linkage between product and customer may never be made. I mentioned new technology in the financial side as we bring in new, new technology, it introduces new capital, but it also introduces that R&D aspect, testing, trialing and execution risk. So considering a softer side of an investment decision in, in, in a company, um, if an operator is deciding where to allocate capital and they've got a super low grade feed into an at times subjective market with these new minerals that we're trying to um, recover and sell, and they're gonna need to invest in new technology, do pilot trials and all that, it starts to push the friendship a little bit when you're trying to allocate uh, capital within the business. And also, when, as mentioned previously, when dealing with these closure commitments, um, the testing and trial work needs to be done. Um, the regulator doesn't just go, yep, we believe you and away you go. That sounds like a great idea. You're going to have to do the work and, and prove up the aspects and that all that takes time. And it also introduces risk because you might undertake that process and an operator might decide, well, you know what, I'd rather go the simple way because at least I know I'm going to get approval if I just do that, just blast all those hills, move all the material there because that at least I'll get approval for that. Anything different, I'm going to have to go through the burden of proof to be able to work my way through it. Another item I've listed here is lack of incentives or the incentives piece. And this is, I've separated into internal and external. So internally, um, novel approaches to closure or tailings management, they're going to cost time and money. Um, and they're potentially going to occur in the back end of a mine life where cash flow is diminishing. Um, the ownership of budgets at an asset um, is, is, and the KPIs of the people owning those budgets are going to, are going to play a part. So, you know, simpl simplistically, people on the production side are going to be chasing margin and are going to be chasing cash costs. Uh, and the people on the environmental side might actually be chasing fast, easy, quick approvals through a system uh, by a particular date. And neither of those KPIs are going to align with attacking innovative closure uh, planning or necessarily tailings reprocessing. The other side of things is um, the, in, especially in larger companies, the division of expertise and decision making is, uh, is, is often going to be dispersed. And the KPIs again, and the, uh, and the best decisions in those different groups are going to be different. So as an example, you might have um, your um, environmental mine, uh, monitoring and compliance team, your dam construction and, uh, and execution team, um, your closure planning and estimating team, and all of these people are specialists in their own areas, but they've got different KPIs over different times in, a life, in the life cycle of facility, and the decisions that they make may not align with uh, eventual reprocessing or innovative closure practices. That leads me on to conflicts with closure planning. So this might be specific to our site, uh, but I imagine it's probably likely uh, relevant to others as well. But um, the time and effort 
uh, that has gone into and is going into getting the approval for the PRCP, which Daisy mentioned, um, is substantial to say the least. It's it's huge, and it's it's also quite linear. Like we need to choose, we need to get on a get on a horse and ride it, and all of the resources that are going into that are then not available to tackle or consider innovative or alternate solutions. So I'll pass back to Daisy now and she'll give you a bit of a deep dive on this uh, PRCP aspect. Great, thanks Alistair. So just building on that and you know, just to acknowledge as well, our study has been very focused on kind of tailings reprocessing or repurposing from a let's pick it up and do something to it so we reduce it. But the PRCP closely relates to more so the repurposing aspect of the footprint as well. So once you've got a tailings facility, can you do something to that land so it becomes useful after um, useful to society after the mine closes? And I wanted to look at the gardens from our PRCP framework here in Queensland to see what sort of limitations exist in terms of the different types of options you might be able to explore. And specifically defines rehabilitation as getting the land into a stable condition. Now, what does that mean? It means that the land is safe and non-polluting, so it doesn't cause any environmental harm, but it can also sustain the chosen post-mine land use, or PMLU. PMLU is then defined further in, in the gardens, and it gives, gives a range of examples of what could be considered a PMLU. So native ecosystems, to forestry, to industrial land, to water storage facilities. It doesn't explicitly state that an option is to rehabilita rehabilitate the land to its former condition, provided that community planning schemes, governments are aligned with the postman land use. So what does that mean? means technically we can explore options that are different and innovative and look at options which provide long-term socioeconomic benefits to communities around a closed mine site. Okay, so that begs the question, how many sites in Queensland have been fully rehabilitated? And according to the Queensland Mine Rehab Commissioner, the answer is none. Okay. What about repurposed sites? And I quite like Holcomb and Keenan, um, who are from, from the SMI. Um, they, they did a study uh, looking at repurposing case studies around the world. And within Queensland, they only identified one, which is the Kidston Clean Energy Hub. So for those who don't know, this is a abandoned mine. Um, it was abandoned in 2001. And Genex Power came along and repurposed this mine into a clean energy project. An example of the types of thing they did there is turn their tailings facility into a 50 megawatt solar farm, which you can see pictured up on the slide here. This is a very innovative and great solution for society. It provides long-term socioeconomic benefits by creating industry, and it also helps produce green energy for society, which supports with the um, net, net zero transition. So it's a great example. Sorry, <laughs> just need to look at my notes. But it is telling that there's only one, one example. And Alice already spoke to what some of the challenges are in the repurposing and reprocessing space. But I think some of these challenges also exist within the footprint repurposing space, if you will. And I think the challenge is that coming up with some of these solutions take a significant amount of time, collaboration, resources. And this can be challenging to do within the timelines required by regulators to complete PRCPs. I think the CRC time said it quite well in their post mine land use report, um, for which, from which I've extracted a quote here. An unintended outcome of environmental regulations in Australia is that it is often heavily focused on the desirability to rehabilitate sites but pays little attention on how to look for opportunities to repurpose these places. Okay, what if we take a step back and look outside of Queensland? It tells a similar story. 95% of closed sites in the world are considered inactive 
with only 141 repurposing case studies. So one way to view this is that there are many stumbling blocks to repurposing. But I think we need to challenge that thinking. There are already 141 repurposing case studies, many who have turned the challenges that Alistair and I have described today into stepping stones. And I started this presentation by stating that only in sharing success can we grow it. And despite us having many unresolved questions and the industry having many unresolved questions, I think it is also important to share some of the successes that we've had in our study. So we've sort of a list of a few here, but one of the main things that um, I think we've, we've done a good job with, with some of the team, hopefully um, listening on online, is doing the resource modeling um, aspect of our tailings facility. We've got a much greater understanding of what is in those tailings, we've got a resource model, and we've also debunked some myths about variability. It turns out to be much lower than what people had initially thought. Whilst we've closed the door on sort of a simple and pass simple and fast approach, sorry. We've also identified many new technologies that are emerging and out there that we need to go and do some further testing on to see if our tailings could be run through those processes. The other strength that our site has as well is that we've got time. At the moment, the closure date for Manizer Mines is 2037, um, with George Fisher continuing to, to operate. We're looking at some other extension projects as well. So this means that we have time up our sleeve to actually go away and explore some of these different technologies, different approaches, so that we can um, build a, a bigger long-term view and strategy of what could be applied to our tails. And we can also then benefit the time that it takes for society to shift its thinking towards looking at mining and, and closure as alternative, sorry, as repurposing opportunities, as um, projects that can benefit society long term, as opposed to just trying to close it and rehabilitate it. Pass back over to you. Thanks, Daisy. So, in um, some just some closing remarks, um, we obviously see that we're moving into probably some uncharted territory um, as an industry. The ore bodies are going to be getting more complex. Uh, we're probably going to be needing finer grinding, going to be having to hit things with uh, more aggressive processing technologies to continue extract, extracting the metal and the minerals that we need, which will further complicate our reuse pathway. Uh, we're also going to be faced with increasing regulation around our tailing storage facilities and our environmental uh, impact. So therefore, we, we'd like to say that we see a really strong business case for tailings reprocessing and repurposing at a macro level, but need to acknowledge the difficulties and the challenges challenges at a site and asset based level. So potentially it's more appropriate for us to be looking rather than the business case is that logic case or the value case or the social case for this for this aspect and really continuing to maintain that privilege to operate that, that Daisy mentioned earlier. Um, there is no silver bullet to the um, to the mining of reprocessing of tailings and each site is going to have its own challenges, uh, whether that be a restart hurdle or mineralogy or distance, distance to market. Uh, new technologies are going to be required and that's both new to a site, new to an asset or both new to in, or new to industry um, R&D that hasn't yet been thought of. And then there's this aspect of this transformational change is really going to be only possible through collaboration along at multiple levels. So within organisations, we need uh, the case for innovative closure and the different approaches to managing our tailings legacy to um, have alignment across corporate and technical disciplines. Um, within that regional uh, aspect, that local industry and the environmental, social ecosystem, um, industrial ecosystem needs to be understood to be able to unlock these um, the circular economy opportunities. And then more at that more um, state, national, and even global level, uh, we need the alignment in the well-intended policies and legislations and take a systems approach to those so that they actually align and inspire uh, the, the, the right and incentivize the right 
behaviours, the innovative behaviours that we need. And I've, I've included a, a term there that I thought was fantastic. I heard a couple of days ago, um, and credit to Sarah Gooley from AMEC, um, policy harmonisation. Well, that was fantastic. And so where to for us now? So we've basically recommended at this stage to pause our formal concept study process and, and, and pivot away from taking our concept study through a formal gating process um, and, and along the study pipeline um, to a more testing and trial phase uh, that Daisy just, just alluded to. We've done enough thinking and we understand enough about our problems and our potentials to now know what we don't know. And we need to go back to the drawing board and the science and the testing and the trials and throw our tailings at a bunch of different technologies and work with the environmental guys on how we understand what we're going to influence in our closure, um, our closure opportunities by going through this reprocessing, um, re reprocessing pathway. And that'll allow us to come back to the table with some numbers that we can um, evaluate our different options better. Uh, we really appreciate your time and, and hope that you take a, something small away from this to uh, future studies of your own. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daisy and working. Thanks very much, Daisy and Alistair. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I really like the fact that you pointed out um, the the fact that you know the the production people and the environmental people and the the KPIs don't always align. And I think that's something we we see across the board in in the mining industry, and that does really need to be um, addressed. Um, so, do we have any questions for either either of them? We just have a mic issue. I'm just. Hello, is this one working? Okay. Uh, yeah, so that was really great. I learned so much and it made me think about so many different things and I really appreciated it. Um, you had this slide about what's stopping the the industry from moving forward with, with tailings reprocessing, which was which was really great. Uh, and on the financial side, you discussed about the the, pos the the problem with pricing in the future environmental cost of of mine closure, um, which is something companies, as you mentioned, have always been optimistic about. Um, and you know, it it's obvious whenever a big mine goes under and the the public is responsible for it, it's a billion dollar or two billion dollar process lots of times to to do that. Uh, so I guess hypothetically. Uh, if governments required companies to put that money in a bond up front, a billion dollars or a two billion dollars uh, up front for that, how how do you think the business office uh, in your company would would respond to that? How does that change to the logic if if you're required to do that up front um, with obviously you know uh, rebates for for doing things like tailings reprocessing along the way? Be better qualified than me to answer. So, so we do currently have have money in a in a bond. We are required to to put money aside. It's it's calculated uh, calculated on a standard calculator. So, I, I I think you could you could potentially argue that the standard calculator has some flaws because inherently we are as an industry under underestimating um, on an ongoing basis. So that's one aspect. Uh, the challenge, I guess, you know, so we're already doing it. Is it enough? You know, maybe not. Um, the challenge there is, especially for um, you know, smaller operators or people wanting to enter the space and do something innovative, that's certainly a challenge. And I know speaking with the team from New Century, that was definitely one of their hurdles. So they had a lot of money that had to be tied up in bond, even though they were going down this innovative route of reprocessing and, and you know, using it to rehabilitate the site but they couldn't access that money and there was no offset, there was no rebate. So it's a balance between, yes, companies should and do put money aside for closure. Um, maybe it's not enough, uh, but I think it's really looking at these policies with, and the systems approach that you, you want to incentivize the right behavior instead of having it um, you know, be defensive and preclude, you know, we just want to hold your money because what are, you know, what's the state coffers doing with that money while they've got it? Um, as opposed to, you know, if you genuinely have a good idea and you want to go and chase down some science that's going to make things better, we you can we can access that money to do it. 
Yeah, might just build on that as well. Um, I think, as Elsa alluded to, that's money that's being held up and for the right reasons, but that means that there is also money that could have otherwise been used to explore R&D or explore these different options. So um, it's about finding the balance between ensuring that liabilities is covered, but not in a way which restricts people from then spending that money in more innovative um, or, or innovative uh, prospects or, or research and development that could actually help unlock the socioeconomic benefits long term. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for a great talk. And um, as you've, Alistair, mentioned in, in your statement, the stuff in the tailings has already been processed once, and the guys have done a really good job of getting what they can out of it using the existing processes. So to try and reprocess it the same way again, it's just not going to give you the same outcome. And to um, to develop something new and different, you know, it requires R&D, which takes time and effort and money. So, like, we are R&D guys here. How can we help you? How can we work better with you? to be able to fit within the constraints that you are experiencing. Come and help us. <laughs> That's part of the reason why yeah. we're here. <laughs> and I think, I mean, we, you know, sort of the last 12 months, we've been working with some people in your team and we've been also waiting because we've got a large facility, right? Like 1500 hectares. We wanted to get samples quickly. So we took a hand auguring approach to understand sort of that top 10 meters. And also getting samples at depth to see, you know, does the material actually look different down there? The answer is not that much, um, which is good. So we've got a better understanding of the, the whole resource. But now that we have that information, we can actually meaningfully start having the conversations with the people like yourself in terms of coming up with different ideas. And that's what we're planning on doing over the, the next little while to make sure that we're investing our, our resources in the right, right areas. In order to find us. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a great talk, very inspiring. I have my thesis review coming up in four weeks and I'm looking forward to um, referring back to your talk today, <laughs> which will be good. But I wanted to ask a question about how um, Glencore made the decision to go down this route. I mean, you talked about the Ernst & Young, you know, risks to the mining business and everything like that. There is a lot of talk in industry about how, looking after tailings and, and managing them differently is um, something that everyone aspires to do, but hardly any companies put their money where their mouth is. And Glencore seems to have done that um, with your team. So what was the what was the business decision to be able to do that? How, why is Glencore, you know, actually acting on this? Uh, probably the... I alluded to that the size of the facility and the liability associated with it is, is, is huge. So there's a big incentive to uh, to look for ways to reduce that. So that, that's that's one ma one major aspect is is purely um, the realization of um, having to having to rehabilitate that facility. And there's there's big money at stake in terms of if we can do it better. Uh, additionally, I guess a, a spur locally was that uh, the copper mine has recently announced closure, which potentially frees up a concentrator. So, um, you know, in, in the, the simple path was we've got the stuff, let's throw it through the concentrator and see what we can get out of it. Um, now, obviously that's not gonna make us money. We've, we've shown that, um, but it's the, it's the, and then, and then us, so we sort of probably had also the right people um, in the business at the time that sort of flagged up that all these different avenues that we might be able to take. And I, I think, you know, I, I'm I'm comfortable that Glencore are doing are doing some good things and we're moving in the right direction. But I also do like as we've looked around across industry, there is a huge amount being done by all different companies. And you know, the BHPs, the Rios, the Vales, you know, everyone is all singing to the same song sheet, and they are they are putting their money with their where their mouth is. It's just you know, it's in competition to all the other noise and all the other priorities that a mining company has. So everyone is doing it. Um, it's definitely not just Glencore, um, but yeah, we're definitely um, definitely on the on the path now in the right in the right direction as an industry. Thanks. Um, we've actually run out of time, but maybe we can have one more quick question. Uh, for the people online, um, 
You can just uh, reach out via email. So both of the emails are on the screen currently. Um, so this will just be the last question. Look, it wasn't going to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll just have one and keep it quick. If if you had to start, if you were starting these operations right now, given your all the things that you have learned in the last 12 months, how would you redesign the project? Oh, I like this question. Do you mean, sorry, the reprocessing project or just the site as a whole, whole thing? Well, I think that's where these, some of these prevention and, and reduction technologies come into play, right? And one example that we've, we've seen in industry here in Queensland actually is EQ Resources. Um, they've implemented um, Tomra sorting technologies and they're using it in sort of a waste reprocessing application, but can easily, from the technology, kind of distinguish between sulfides and, and non-sulfides. And that's really important also to understand, you know, what is your acid generating material potentially coming out of your mine. But, you know, if you're looking at other byproducts such as uh, sulfuric acid, then you've got a, a potential revenue stream that you can um, sort of turn to feed to an, another revenue stream. And then the other aspect is then you have clean fill that you can actually do something useful with. So in, in the case of EQ resources, they sell that clean fill as aggregate um, for a whole bunch of uh, different industries. And I think they've got some arrangements potentially with the Department of Transport at Main Roads to fill into their, um, their road base, for example. So I think actually looking at, at your problem holistically, um, understanding where you can implement technologies so that you reduce waste and reduced tailings upfront, I think is probably the most effective way to um, reduce and, and prevent tailings. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. That's all we have time for today. Um, so let's give a, another thank you to Alex and Crazy. Um, and then next week we have um, Tuan Ngin from the SMI talking here at the JK um, MLC Friday seminar. So I hope to see you all there. Thanks. <laughs>